I, I think we could do a whole podcast on just this topic alone, mm -hmm. <laughs> because one of the things that I, I want to say about it is it makes sense that someone is trying to find their way to safety when this big discoveries happen, happen that feels incredibly unsafe, right? And if a woman believes, for whatever reason, that um, that's having sex with her partner will prevent him from further acting out. I want to just validate that finding safety makes sense. Welcome to the Faithful and True Podcast. We're happy to be with you today with our usual host, Dr. Greg Miller, and Greg's wife, Beth. Hi, Beth. How are you? Good to see you, as always. Doing well. Thank you. And from our staff, Elizabeth Hardesty is joining us today. So we uh, went all out. We're paying top dollar in 2023 for high high volume or a high, highly qualified guest like Beth and Elizabeth. And uh, they're with us today to talk about uh, things not to do once you have uh, encountered following disclosure or discovery. And uh, Greg, uh, can you think of an, yeah. an even well, and more effective way of getting into this? Well, we're very fortunate because both Beth and Elizabeth um, lead groups for women, um, work with women. And so, as I understand it, they reached out to some of the women and just asked the question, um, what were some of the things that you did early on after the, sometimes we talk about it as the explosion or the plane, uh, plane crash or the um, uh, discovery, but what were some of the things that you did that were helpful and what were some of the things that you did that weren't helpful? And we're going to be doing two podcasts, so we're going to start with what were some of the things that you discovered that women told you that in hindsight they wished they hadn't done or in hindsight they realized it wasn't as helpful in those early days? Well, um, it's good to be here with you guys today. And Elizabeth and I have had a lot of conversations about this, both with clients that we work with and about our own stories. And the first thing that I want to just say is, as we're thinking about um, what wasn't helpful following discovery, I just want to say loads of grace, oceans of grace, where, wherever you find yourself, if you are listening to this, maybe you're thinking, I could add some things to this list. I bet I know some things they're going to talk about. Um, certainly some of the things we're going to talk about today are things that I wished I had done differently. Elizabeth, it might be the same for you too. So um, I, I just want to really start with that, um, that word, that wherever you are, um, uh, may you have grace with yourself. And if you are just in the process of discovering some painful information, um, about your spouse's acting out or a situation, you know, that you weren't aware of. Um, we hope some of these things will help you to make different choices. Um, the first one that I would say is one of the big ones that came up is people indicated that it was not helpful to isolate and to tell no one. Now, it's so understandable, right, that um, we get afraid. We are fearful. We have no idea who we can trust with this kind of information. And yet what we know is that this is so painful, but it's just really um, detrimental to carry this alone. So I think that's one of the things that can happen is we, we just keep ruminating then on it like a pinball bouncing around, you know, on a pinball machine with no safe place to land. Well, one, one thing I've heard um, the women at Faithful and Drew talk about is we are aware, you know, working with the men, that the men 
have a lot of shame about the choices that they've made. And um, they don't want people to know because of shame. But I've heard many of you say that women and the wives experience the same thing. Um, that when this starts to come out, they their shame gets triggered. And when our shame gets triggered, we do want to isolate. And one of the ways we try to manage it is by keeping it hidden, not telling anybody. And so just acknowledging for the wives that are out there that are experiencing shame because of their husband's choices, it's typical, it, it, it's, it's something that is expected, and it's also not helpful. Yeah, that was a big part of my story and something I often share early on is uh, when a few years into our marriage, I had a disclosure from Chris. I, I didn't, I, the shame you're talking about, Greg, I did not know what to do with that information. I, I didn't even think about talking about it because it was so shameful, you know? And so for me, it was this one you're mentioning here, Beth, of telling no one, isolating, um, and then just the ruminations, what can kind of go on and what you can start to believe, right? And the things that can start to kind of form in your mind around just beliefs about yourself, beliefs about your relationship. It's hard to kind of right-size those when you're just doing all that internally. Mm -hmm. what, what might be some of the, the messages of shame or the lies that a woman might believe about herself when this information comes out about choices that her husband has made? Oh, there are so many. You know, the first one that comes to my mind is I wasn't enough. Um, and I'm not fill in the blank. I'm not beautiful enough. I'm not thin enough. I'm not sexy enough. Um, I don't have enough sex with my husband. I mean, there could be so many of those things. And of course, you know, once we get into recovery, we start to understand that if we're in shame, we're believing a lie. And yet one of the other things that I really want to emphasize about these early days of discovery is that we're in trauma. And one of the things that happens when we're in trauma is we do not think clearly, right? And so that, that really, really gets chaotic. We can have all kinds of, um, well, I, I think it's ripe for these shame messages. Mm -hmm. When one thing I'm hearing in what you're saying, Beth, is that for a lot of women, one of their early reactions is they believe that it's their their fault. Absolutely. And that if they had done something different or if they were different, they could have prevented this. And you know, one of the things that we want the men to, to do early on is take total responsibility for their actions and for their addictions. And I can imagine that it's much more complicated for a woman if her husband is actually telling her it's her fault. Mm -hmm. And so the more she's isolated and not hearing other messages, if the only message she's hearing from is from her spouse and he's saying it's her fault, it makes perfect sense that her shame is intense. Right. Right. So moving on here, another one is kind of the opposite of that, that we often, some, a lot of women in my group also shared that um, oversharing at first, you know, just not really understanding and knowing who are safe people, who are unsafe people but just wanting to tell as many people as possible and just get it out. And so again, it's, it's a uh, finding this healthy place. We'll talk about later what is helpful, but again, that oversharing, telling too many people and the chaos, the additional chaos that that can start to create. Absolutely. And, and yeah. One I was of the just... things I've heard Beth say to women is it's, almost guaranteed that at the end of this, there were some people that you told early on that you wish that you hadn't. And just to have grace with you, it, that's just the way that it is, but you're not going to know who those people are until in many cases after they've been told. Yeah, exactly. I was, I was just thinking back as we were preparing for this about a particular situation where um, I, I just, for some reason, in hindsight, now I, I, you know, have a better understanding of why. Um, but that's actually oversharing is actually a trauma response. And so for some reason, I felt like I owed someone some details to our story mm -hmm. that I absolutely did not. And it ended up creating more chaos for me because they then told other people they didn't hold that. Those other people then called me asking, like, are you okay? 
you know, for more information. That was not what I needed to be spending my emotional energy on that was so limited anyway. And one of the things that can, I think, fall in this category here is oversharing to children, particularly older children, um, telling too many details to family members. And again, Greg, like you just said, sometimes we don't know who isn't safe until we've told them and we're getting um, advice or we're getting someone's rage, you know, on our behalf that really isn't helpful. Um, there can be a lot of unsolicited advice coming um, to a woman in this situation. And what she's really just looking for is someone to be safe. Mm -hmm. One thing that I just want to distinguish is you mentioned this idea of early on telling children maybe too much. We absolutely believe in um, having conversations with our children, whether they're young or they're adults, because we do see the value of including them. What we're talking about specifically is in those early days when the wife is still getting information, she's not clear about what she needs, and it is more out of a, a fear or a panic or an uncertainty that she's including her children. That's the point that it's not helpful. Once she's more grounded, then absolutely, we would suggest that um, couples go together to tell their children what's going on. Right. And if there are consequences, then children will need to be included early on. There were just some consequences to my story mm -hmm. that the children need to know about. Yeah. And we, over time, shared the information, but those initial conversations were very limited and we got good coaching on how to talk to our, our boys early on. Yeah. Another one um, that, again, is is very understandable early on, especially when you're talking, Greg, about when a, when a woman is feeling like she's not enough, is um, there can be those attempts to try to be enough. And, and so I think uh, becoming sexual, you know, just engaging with your husband sexually and trying to be, um, you know, just more desirable, those types of things. So just engaging really quickly back in, back into the bedroom again is something that we often hear. And again, it's, it's understandable coming from a place of, of, of trying to, um, trying to prove yourself, trying to get him to make mm -hmm. different choices. And yet again, the, the additional pain, the additional chaos that can create for a woman when she is kind of pushing past her, um, her, her own boundaries, pushing past her own feelings, right? In some ways, just even invalidating herself to try to, to control and to hang on mm -hmm. to, to the relationship. Well, and it again, it becomes much more complicated when her husband is telling her if you're not sexual with me, I can't stay sober mm -hmm. or a pastor or a therapist or a book is telling her that that mm -hmm. information. Again, it's reinforcing this idea that um, if you make the correct choices, then you can do your husband's recovery for him. And we absolutely don't believe that at all. And in fact, I often tell the men, the goal for you is to learn how to steward your sexuality, especially when you are not being sexual with your spouse. Mm -hmm. And so whether you're being sexual with your spouse or not, sobriety is still possible because it's your sexuality and you can steward it. But for a lot of men, they have their own messages um, and maybe they've been told or read that they have to be sexual in order to stay sober. And so it makes perfect sense that if a wife is getting those messages, it becomes about fear, it becomes about obligation, and we know that fear and obligation will not lead to the intimacy that ultimately the couple need and desire. That's right. right. Yes. I, I think we could do a whole podcast on just this topic alone, mm -hmm. <laughs> because one of the things that I, I want to say about it is it makes sense that someone is trying to find their way to safety when this big discoveries happen, happen that feels incredibly unsafe right? And if a woman believes for whatever reason that um, that's having sex with her partner will prevent him from further acting out. Um, I want to just validate that finding safety makes sense. 
And Elizabeth, you said, and man, we've heard this a lot over the years, that people will often say, I, I felt um, like I had to disassociate from myself to do that. I wasn't honest with myself. That really wasn't what was true to my sense of well-being. And yet I, I was scrambling. I didn't know what else to do. And Greg, you mentioned that maybe they read that in a book or heard it from a pastor. And boy, I, I just want to say, pastors, if you are listening, please don't tell a wife who has been betrayed to um, go get back in bed with her husband that that's going to solve this issue. There are so many more factors to this to help validate how betrayed she feels and a process to walk out that will hopefully, if there's healing, lead to healthy sexuality, mm -hmm. right? Um, what, that, one, yeah. uh, one other scenario that we hear about is, so there's been this um, sharing of information um, and for a season, there's this sense of intimacy and connection that the wife finally understands something, the husband is being honest, maybe he's being more emotionally present. And so there is this sense of intimacy and out of that intimacy, there is a desire to be sexual. Nobody's encouraging it, nobody's you know, inviting them to do it. They just find their way back towards being sexual. And I, I do think for those couples who in those early days after disclosure, they're experiencing intimacy, what can easily happen is at some point the wife begins to realize that's not helpful for her as she finds her hurt and her anger and her sadness. So that intimacy wasn't false. It just wasn't sustainable without this other help that she needs to experience healing. And so if you're listening and you're one of those and we hear stories of what we refer to as recovery babies. We're early on after discovery, there was intimacy, that intimacy led to a pregnancy. And that has its own complications after the wife begins to get connected with her hurt and her anger. So it's not always that she's told to do this. There's this genuine the desire to do this. But as she continues her journey, that desire may not be sustainable. Yeah. Sure. And, and something else there, Greg, maybe that's not helpful would be, you know, for uh, again, for a woman to not listen to herself, right? That to maybe mm -hmm. have a belief that, well, I've I've started to re-engage sexually and so therefore I have to continue to re-engage sexually versus understanding a need to perhaps take a break and do some of that deeper work of working through the, the pain and the trauma of that. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things along this uh, line here Greg, you were saying, you know, like there might be this initial connection. I think some women that I've spoken with over the years believe once they start having sex with their partner again, that that's it, you know, that they can't have a no if they do find themselves in a lap of grief or anger. And um, that would fall in the not so helpful category, right? Mm -hmm. Because we absolutely do have our no. Absolutely. Well, and I often teach that in order for there to be healthy sexuality, everybody gets their yes and everybody gets their no. And at any given moment, someone can say yes and someone can say no, and both need to be heard and that no needs to be acknowledged. But if I've ever felt like I've lost my no in my sexuality, it's not going to serve me, it's not going to be helpful, and it's certainly not going to lead to the intimacy that God desired for sexuality. Beth, you want to take the next one? Yeah, what's yeah. something else that wasn't helpful? Well, I think there's a category of a few things that fall into this of a real over-controlling posture. And that might look like contacting his friends or his family. I've heard of women who contacted his employer and, you know, in the end regretted uh, responding out of that very angry place. Um, but another part of this looks like telling our, you know, a woman telling her husband, you're going to read this, you're not going to watch that, you're going to do X, Y, and Z. And that becomes very um, maternal in nature. It's like a mother-son rather than two partners. 
And again, I want to say, if you're listening and you, you know, you find yourself thinking I might have done that. Um, I just want to say again, oceans of grace, because my guess is that was about trying to find some safety, trying to scramble to safety. What's also true is that that isn't sustainable behavior. And at the end of the day, what we really need as uh, a spouse in a relationship with someone who's working on an addiction is to know that they are internally motivated to be well, that whatever choices they make aren't because we're driving that train, right? It's because they're choosing that. And what's complicated is mm -hmm. for a lot of men, they are highly motivated. Um, and yet because maybe their wife is regularly making suggestions or following up with things, the wife questions whether or not the husband is motivated or only doing it because of her suggestions. One of the best ways to identify your husband's motivation is to stop the suggestions and see if he continues to go to group. He continues to get appointments with his therapist because as long as I'm making those suggestions, I'm not going to be clear about his motivation and maybe the, the husband isn't either, but in the absence of those, then maybe there can be some clarity about where the spouse is on his journey of recovery. Good. Well, another one, we'll keep rolling down the list here, but another mm -hmm. one that we often hear early on. And again, the, the, the need behind this is really valid. The need for information of what happened is so valid. And certainly is something that we uh, believe at Faithful and True that, that a wife needs the information of, of what was um, the acting out, what was the information. And sometimes early on, it's, it's, it's kind of that pursuit of those details around the behaviors that, can, that we find can be really harmful. Um, we differentiate between information that is hurtful and, and information that is harmful. And sometimes those minute details of things that we just continue to pursue and pursue um, the details of information, it, it really can be harmful mm -hmm. to a woman. Mm -hmm. And so just there too, just knowing that we do have a process at Faithful and True of, of getting that foundation of truth, of understanding what happened. But sometimes early on, again, it's understandable why we're trying to find that safety to understand what happened to us. And those details sometimes can be to add, add more trauma. Mm -hmm. When Elizabeth. we teach, when we teach about full disclosure at the workshop for the men, I would say the number one question we get is, "What details do I share?" Mm -hmm. And the reality is, it is the wife that determines that. You know, one of the things that we tell the men is, if your wife is asking questions, you answer that question honestly and thoroughly, because if you don't, you just come across as if you're hiding and lying. Even mm. if you don't believe she needs to know that, you still answer the question. What I think is most helpful is when a wife is getting the support that she needs from a wise therapist and other wise women in formulating, what really do I need to know? Um, Beth and I have done some full disclosures in the past. And typically when a wife is asking a very specific detailed question, there is a reason why she needs to know that. And if she's gotten some help and support, she even understands why she needs to know that. So it's not that details are bad. It's simply that get clarity about why you are wanting to know that specific details. And as you said, Elizabeth, too much detail can eventually be harmful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think along those lines, another one that I would mention is uh, we've heard a lot of women say they waited too long to get good help. And it's understandable. We want to convince ourselves this is his issue. These were his choices. I've been, you know, faithful or this isn't my thing, you know, whatever it is. And yet, while we are not responsible for this addiction, um, we are, it is our role to find the support for ourselves to move through it in healthy ways. And Elizabeth, my guess is you've met with a lot of women who um, just resisted getting help. We've yeah. had women come to the workshop who are angry, like, I would rather spend this money in Cancun, you know, yeah. <laughs> which is understandable. 
-hmm. And once they begin to find that support, it really gives them traction in their healing. Absolutely. Yes. Is there, is there anything that you would say, let's say that a, a woman is listening to us and she hasn't reached out to help for help. Is there anything that you would say invitationally about why it's important to get help? I just, I, I guess I would just say just for myself, because I was one of those women that, you know, went over 10 years of, of not seeking help and not, I guess, not even knowing there was could help what that even meant. Um, and so I, I think just through this journey with for myself, Greg, I I really just believe that there is uh, hope, there is transformation possible for that woman individually, that this, um, this is significant. We will not minimize that. Uh, we're not gonna brush it aside. We're gonna meet her right where she is, but there really is a way through this. And so I think I would just want to just give that message that we are here to come alongside you, not pressure you one way or another, but just to walk alongside you with the hope that um, there is there is another side to this one, journey. One of the things that I've talked to men about is when you reach out for help, when you come to the workshop, it's one of the ways that we acknowledge reality and it's one of the ways that we acknowledge truth. And again, even painful truth sets us free. and I, my my guess is it's also true for women that when they finally call that therapist or show up at that group, it's their way of acknowledging the reality of what's going on and that we can try to deny it. We can try to minimize it. We can rationalize it. And it's not until we try to live in the truth of it that we can begin to experience some freedom from it. I I would say one of the the quotes from my therapist that I've really taken with me, probably about a month in, she said to me, Greg's actions have brought you here and maybe there's a deeper journey for you to walk. And I found that to be a really helpful, meaningful invitation that I wasn't just there because of that, um, that I could absolutely get help for that. and. Um, you know, down the road, there were so many more skills and, um, you know, just so much broader picture of what emotional health could be like in my life. You one, know? one of the images that I've used at the couples workshop is that it's like you were in a car accident, your husband was driving, you were in the passenger seat. You weren't responsible for driving. You had nothing to do with driving and your husband has an accident. And because you were in the car, you are injured in the accident. And so the ambulance comes and says to you, you've been in an accident and to say, well, I wasn't driving or you need to take care of him. That really doesn't serve you because it denies the fact that even though it wasn't your actions, you have been directly impacted by somebody else's actions. And so to be able to say, I wasn't driving, it's not my fault, I was in the car, therefore I need to get the help that I need. And what's interesting is some husbands out there deny the fact that they need help. And I hope that there are some women that will say, even if my husband doesn't get help from this accident, I'm going to choose to do that because I deserve it. And, and I need it because I've been in an accident. Mm -hmm. I. I think that's a great analogy. And I think hopefully that if there's someone listening that um, hasn't yet felt the, uh, like had the agency to move towards getting help, that really does create a good picture of, of why and the need for that. I think the last thing that I would say here is, um, one of the things we heard a lot was uh, that wasn't helpful was feeling like you had to make a quick decision about whether or not to stay or leave the marriage. Elizabeth, do you have thoughts about that one? Mm, I, I would just want to second that. I think we do hear that a lot, don't we? Of, mm. of just feeling like you, you need to, it, it's black or white, it's in or out. 
right? And like, am I going to stay or am I going to go? And um, just feeling that pressure early on when, when you're in the midst of just trying to find your footing, trying to just breathe again, can feel like a pretty overwhelming decision of, of what am I going to do with this relationship? And so, again, very understandable because it's it, it feels like well, my whole world's blown up. It can't continue the way that it has. And yet trying to make a, a big decision like that right away um, can just be overwhelming. And um, as we say around here, our cliche phrase of trusting the process of um, no pressure either way, but just trusting yourself, trusting this one step at a time that 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 answer will come. But mm -hmm. yes, that that pressure to want to make a decision early on is something we often hear. Yeah, absolutely. One, one thing I would add at this point is um, we did do a three-part series, um, a three-part series podcast on this very issue of deciding if you were going to stay and go. And the women therapists of Faithful and True were a part of that. And so if you're listening and that's something that you're you're pondering, you're trying to navigate, I would encourage you to go to the archives and um, seek that that series out because it was incredibly powerful to kind of break it down in very specific ways about that decision about how to move forward when you're considering what your marriage may look like in in the future. So. Well, that's perfect timing, Greg, because I have decided to go, and uh, <laughs> so we have we've reached the end of our podcast time today, but we sure want to thank Elizabeth and Beth today. And in fact, uh, we're going to do a follow-up podcast to this and uh, and feature their great thoughts and experiences with uh, what are some of the helpful things that a, a wife can do uh, once uh, this news has been revealed. So Beth and Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining Greg and myself today. Uh, we'd like to invite everybody to visit faithfulandtrue.com where you will discover lots of resources for yourself, uh, lots of free resources as well. Uh, also information about our three intensive three-day workshops. Uh, every month we do the men's journey workshop and about uh, three times a year we do the women's journey workshop and then the couple's journey workshop a couple of times a year. Uh, check out those details, that information and the opportunity to register for those events. Until we see you again, I'd like to uh, wish you a week that's filled with many blessings and with great vision.